welcome back to another episode of Think Sip Right, where I talk about all kinds of things, and today just happens to be the topic of King Arthur and his legend. Now, the fun thing about this is nobody knows if he was actually real. Some accounts believe that he was a British leader that fought against the Anglo-Saxons in the late 5th to 6th century. They believe that he had single-handedly killed over 960 men in battle. There's other accounts that believe that he may have been a culmination of multiple people throughout history, and we could get into that, but that would be really, really involved. It, it, but it's definitely something to look into because it's, it's really actually kind of cool to see where it might have come from. And of course, there's the third account where people believe that he may not have existed at all, that he was actually a fictional character created for entertainment. So regardless of that fact, he's been used in lore, video games, books, movies ever since entertainment's been involved. One of the reasons why he's argued as not being actually real is because he, in certain big texts, he's not actually referred to at all, historically. But there are many references to the Battle of Camelon, which is Camelot, where he and Mordred fought to the death and they both died in battle. It is said that he is a descendant of Uther Pendragon, which that would be his father and he was a king, and that the king's mentor was a magician named Merlin. Now, a lot of people would argue that magic never actually existed, it's not real, but keep in mind that back in those days, if he were real, a lot of things that an advisor would do would be considered magical or even prophetic. So, I mean, Merlin we could get into in an entirely other episode. He's one of the key figures involved in the King Arthur lore. Actually, a lot of modern tales focus less on King Arthur himself and more on the people that were surrounding him. Uh, his Knights of the Round Table, his wife, Guinevere. You know, it's said that after he kills Mordred in battle in some of these tales, that he actually did get back home uh, to pass the crown off. And then he was taken in exile to the Isle of Avalon for his wounds to be healed and then never heard from again. Now his sidearm that he carried was called the sword, the Excalibur, and the legend was that he was the only person able to pull this sword from a stone, and that actually brought him into power. But if you look at all the different takes on the lure, it seemed he was in royalty to begin with. It just, that was one of the tests to get him into that position. Three of his knights, Percival, Galahad, and Tristan, were said to help organize with Lancelot the quest for the Holy Grail. And we've seen this time and time again. His, his legend is actually associated with the legend of the Holy Grail. And I think I will get into the Holy Grail in another whole episode as well, but he's closely connected to that lore. It was their belief that if they found the Holy Grail before anybody else did, that they could extend their lives and be the protectors of their kingdom indefinitely. Now, of course, the Holy Grail is also closely associated with the Fountain of Youth uh, as far as what it does. And the Fountain of Youth was a previous episode that I did, so if you want to go back and watch that, feel free to. Now, his Knights of the Round Table, what made them special and what made them uh, stand out more prominent than any of these other royal guards were that there were nine of them and they were made up of three pagans, three Jews, and three Christians. So it brought all the religions together in a common theme to be able to safeguard the land for the king. If you ever get a chance, Thomas Mallory wrote a complete comprehensive storytelling of King Arthur himself and everything in his tales. It's actually called The Whole Book of King Arthur and His Noble Knights. And it basically combines all of the tales all together. That was written in the late 15th century and it's one of the major sources for modern fiction on the topic. So speaking of the modern fiction, there's a couple of my favorites that if you're not familiar with King Arthur or even if you are, these are things that you might want to check out. Disney, I'm going to give them credit right off the bat because that was the first 
time I had ever heard the story of King Arthur. The Sword in the Stone, classic animated tale about King Arthur when he's a boy, pulling the sword from the stone. Of course, Merlin's in it and all of that. And it's a Disney movie, so it's just fun anyway, no matter what age you are. And it's good to get the kids introduced that way. Then there's the movie Excalibur, which was done in, I believe, 1981. And I remember watching that in high school, and it was a very adult movie, but it had the Lady of the Lake and all the, all the different things tied in with King Arthur. It was a great movie. Now, of course, the only movie that I can say would actually top that one is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Old British humor will always stand true for me. I know it's not up some people's alleys, but Monty Python, you can't beat this movie, especially the bridge scene. Once Upon a Time, now that's a series that I, I still like. I've stayed with that since the beginning. Uh, this past season, which was not the best season in the world, but this past season had an interpretation of King Arthur. And it was, it was unique in that they kind of put him in a villainous role, which is kind of what I liked about it. But at the same time, I, I kind of wished for that hero king. And speaking of Hero King, that is the name of the chapter in my book, Blood the Second Helping. I've, the reason I cover this topic is because he did come into play in my books as a major character. And when he was introduced in Blood the Second Helping, he basically was the first person who found the weakness of a vampire. And when he discovered that it was silver, his kingdom, which he inherited because he protected them from it, fashioned him a sword named Excalibur out of silver. And this was the weapon that could destroy the vampires. In my spin-off graphic novel and novella, Zombie Incidents, he's also featured in there, real briefly, just giving an order to Coolwitch, his knight, and I, don't, I hope I'm saying that right, but he goes off and he basically leads an army against the final assault of these undead zombies. That had been a few books ago, and then I decided to bring him back in the last book, Planet 8, which revolved around alien visitations in the past, but about what had happened during the years where I didn't cover, because it kind of just, he faded out in the books like he did in the tales. But in the King Arthur legends, I wanted to explain where he had gone, why he had disappeared and suddenly vanished from all record. In Planet 8, he goes for this quest for the Grail, which is not exactly what modern legend of the Grail is, and he finds the Grail. And what he does is this basically enables him to stay alive longer. And he and Guinevere discover a new kingdom with the help of a man named Noah, which he also has historical significance. And they basically find this underground world, much like a hollow earth. And they live there for thousands of years, basically protecting humanity and overlooking everything from their new kingdom of Avalon down there. So much so that he lives long enough to actually pull Amelia Earhart from her crashed wreckage. So he actually is the one who saves her and brings her on board. And I'm not giving too much away of the story, but the way I tie him in with history... If you know anything about World War II, um, Adolf Hitler was fascinated with the theory of a hollow earth. So he actually, at the end of his reign, there's many conflicts on Adolf Hitler's disappearance. Well, I have his Nazis going down and finding this inner earth, and basically there's this big war under our feet in the 1940s, and King Arthur is still alive. He faces off against Hitler, and they end up killing each other in battle, basically. It's like a final showdown. It's a reenactment of what happened between King Arthur and Mordred. And one final thing, I wanted to announce that I partnered up again with another great company, St. Petersburg Vodka, which I'm drinking right now with a little lemon and some seltzer. It's just great to have some vodka in club. But the cool thing about this vodka is I picked it with this episode because it actually has a, a really cool sword on it, and I thought that that would closely tie with Excalibur, even the mention of it. St. Petersburg Vodka, what makes it a little bit different, is that it is not your typical potato vodka. It's actually distilled from wheat, and it's organic. So I highly recommend checking it out. 
I will put links to that at the slideshow at the end with some other really cool things and in the description. So what are your thoughts on King Arthur? Do you think he was real? What are your favorite tales associated with King Arthur? Are there books that you could recommend? Please comment. Feel free to tweet me. Make sure to hashtag ThinkSipRight. Drop me a line for any future suggestions and cheers.